Bob Lawson. I've had a lot of careers in my life, different types of businesses, but I've had one real consistent love of life, and that has been trains. And then and it, my real life in working with real trains, graduated into a total life with model trains. And the uh, size that I have built since 1970s is the HO size, of which this layout we're going to take a look at is. My railroad tries to represent the hills and mountains uh, of that, that run, and it's a major background for the small towns and industries along the way. The one thing about modeling the CNO and TP is it's basically rural because once it gets out of Chattanooga, all of the towns until it gets to Lexington, Kentucky, even, there's, there's, there tend to be small towns, and in the 1940s, they were really small. The, all of my scenes take place at 4 o'clock in the afternoon during the month of September. The reason for 4 o'clock is on my scenes, the factories are closing the first shift, and I have workers going and workers going to different places in towns, and yet the town businesses are still open. This railroad is divided in, it's a large room, 34 by 52, and it, the east side of the room travels from Chattanooga traveling north towards Kentucky. The western room, uh, side of the room starts in Somerset and travels north to the Ohio River. The buildings that we'll see here are primarily scratch built. Some are kit bashed and some are the kits with a mix of commercial parts. Virtually every building here, every single building and every group of buildings is built as a diorama, which I started back in the 80s and then placed on the railroad. They're built on a workbench where it's very easy to complete everything. And every, every building, every car, every, every detail is weathered to represent age and time. The final scene is the Ohio River where barges are being loaded, pushed along the river near Cincinnati and where the CNO and TP Railroad terminates at Erlanger. We'll look at that later in this uh, video. Okay, first we'll start in the southern end of Tennessee in Chattanooga, moving north. This is to represent the city of Chattanooga in the 1940s, the downtown area. You can see two downtown streets curving um, an alley between buildings with all the loading and, the, and uh, things that people do and uh, furnishing things for the businesses. We've got buses, vehicles, cars, and it's backgrounded by the hills that, that, that Chattanooga has. Just outside Chattanooga is WDOD, which is a radio station, which is the radio station in, in uh, Chattanooga. Then coming out of Chattanooga, the road goes down towards the, turn to the Chattanooga Union Terminal. And the road comes down. In the meantime, as it comes across, there are local businesses. On this hill is the Lugan Buell Wood Products, which makes everything from broomsticks to shovel handles. Uh, but here we have the uh, Chattanooga Union Terminal, which is is the uh, terminal that serves the Southern Railway and the NC in St. Hill. It's, it's a, not an exact replica of the terminal building, but it gives the idea of a busy day with cars arriving, taxi cabs bringing people in. In this station, the people go downstairs to the arriving and departing tracks of the passenger trains. And these are the trains that head north, go all the way through into Chicago, ultimately. Behind this, there's a railway express agency, but this is the main scene right here. Our next scene is the little town of Dayton, which is just northwest of Chattanooga. And uh, in Dayton, the town is, is a little distance from here. What this tries to represent is the Pullman Company. Anytime they had a terminal as large as the terminal at Chattanooga, close by in some little area, they like to have a facility for cleaning the insides of their Pullman cars, the sleeping cars. So this represents the Pullman Company has a facility here on the outside of Dayton which cars could be pulled over in an operation and placed here and then returned. 
And this is to represent a typical little group of buildings beside the railroad track or the yard. <clears throat> kind of run down apartments and a little uh, sandwich shop and a pool hall and a barber shop and a little automobile repair which worked on, on pickup trucks, that type thing. And the little people here are all representative of, of that kind of a situation. Just over on the side is a uh, small locomotive repair facility which was used for servicing the locomotives that worked in the Chattanooga passenger yard. One of the main things in this general area, and this is one of my favorite buildings, this is a scratch built building also. Uh, this is called the William Lenore Furniture Company, making chairs and other types of furniture. I li always liked the pictures I saw of this a building very similar to this. So I built this building and, uh, and named it after William Lenore, Bill Lenore, who was a good friend of mine many, many years ago. Bill was, in fact, one of the original founders and signers of the founding of the National Model Railroad Association. That's what this represents, and it would be a main uh, industry for this Dayton area. The next scene north of Chattanooga is on Chickamauga Mountain which is the Swanson and Wines Lumber Company. This is a, a typical small company that lumber uh, logs are brought down from the other side of the mountain by log trucks. They're dumped by the sawmill building. There's a loader there to set them in place. We have a typical sawmill here that handles sawing them to the different sizes. And this, this company primarily builds just dimension lumber for framing. And then they, after they're sawed, they're put through a planing mill, which is in the middle, and then stacked for drying. Once they reach that point, they only load them in boxcars. They load lumber, mostly like two by fours, two by eights, two by tens, into the boxcars from here. And then they're taken by the Shea locomotives. One is sitting there near its, that, that first little building, open building, is a Shea repair shed. But the shade type locomotives are good for these steep hills on you know, through the mountains. And about typically on a normal day, about eight cars of lumber could be loaded and pulled out by the shades and taken down the mountain to the industries like the Lenore Furniture Company. Watson and Nancy Wines are good friends. They're two of the greatest modelers in the United States. And, and uh, they're very well known. But this pictures a, a good uh, little lumber mill. The next town along the main line is Oakdale, Tennessee. Oakdale, like Dayton, the, the town area is a little distant from here. This is the businesses. This is a little small business area, but with one big business, John Bowling Paint and Oil Company, this big building in the foreground here. There's a plumbing distributor over here some small businesses, a couple of restaurants of, of different types. So there's nothing that is other than small business or uh, rail traffic. And there's a the next town going north is Spring City. Spring City is a very small town situated up in the hills. And this is to represent some of the businesses outside of town. The rail line runs behind you. It's not seen here, but the, uh, these are just small businesses that make small things, welding shops, uh, small cabinet shops, and uh, they do have a station on the other side, and the rail line that comes by is a rail line that ultimately goes across trestles to serve the uh, Swanson and Wines Lumber Company. The next town going north on the southern main line is Harriman Junction. Harriman Junction is a fairly major uh, area for the railroad because it also branches out to the uh, coal fields in the Shelby City area. But this represents a number of businesses and small uh, manufacturers along the main line. There's a siding that serves all of these buildings. There's a uh, little service uh, building for the switch engines for this area. The main lines will come through and drop cars for these various 
industries, which includes a chemical company, uh, welding and iron company, uh, clothing uh, distributor, a, a tool company that manufactures certain small tools, various businesses, a building material company, and the one in the front here is the Ennis Brothers uh, Lum Coal and Lumber Company for local coal deliveries. And it, it just spreads across, but it, it is truly a, it's a main part of this railroad. The passenger station is in the middle. That's one building that I didn't build, Howard Zane, who's a well-known nationally model railroader in Columbia, Maryland, whom I've been friends with for many years, gave me this some years ago. He built that station. And then there's one other little sideline of a couple of businesses up here right on the track. But this has been a very interesting one to most people who come here because I've had visitors who were born in Harriman Junction and have families that still live in the Harriman Junction area. So even though this isn't the downtown or the residential, it really meant a lot to them. Okay, the next area represents northwest of Chattanooga. There was an area called Shelby City. Shelby City is, is the area where coal mines were uh, uh, more plentiful, and, and there's with little towns scattered around. Shelby City was one of the best known ones. To represent this area, what I did was I built the two coal tipples. I have the company houses of the company store of, the, of this company that I'm going to show in a minute. And then the little town area, little business area, little passenger station on the end over there. And the main thing is is down in this yard area. The this and we do, I call this the Tennessee Consolidated Coal Company in the Shelby City Mines. The purpose of that was so that from a, an operating standpoint, empty cars could be pushed into these these tracks, loaded cars that were brought in were taken out on main lines. Then we maintained a, a locomotive that was heavy duty enough. This is a 2660. And it would take the empty cars, switch around to the two tipples, we'll see one in a minute, and the one up on the hill, and then bring back loaded cars to here. So it, this just represents a, a uh, maintenance shop for locomotives or any other equipment uh, that was needed in the mines, but it's all part of uh, the idea of, uh, of an area that Shelby City had uh, coal mines and then they brought the coal down here. Okay, the next little area on the northernmost part of Tennessee is a little state park that we tucked in here called Delta State Park and Lake Casper. They're named Delta and Casper because that's Sandra's grandson's dogs. This is to represent a little 1940s motels probably built in the 20s. And it's, and it's an area that has boating and fishing and camping and hiking and uh, little refreshments and picnicking and little scenic platforms for looking and people come and mo motorcycles, campers anyway. But uh, as much as anything besides this little uh, state park, this is a good place to mention that two or three things that are very important in the development of the scenery in this whole railroad. Besides, everything on the railroad is built on, on foam. And I, I use one and a half pound of white foam, very similar to the Dow Blue Board. But the, and I carve them out. Then the thing that amazes most people, and this is a good place to see them, is the rock formations that I have scattered all through the entire railroad. They represent the shale, which is which is an important, that's what's in Kentucky and Tennessee. But the thing that amazes people is they wonder how in the world I carve all of these. I don't carve them, they're rubber. And it's and I've introduced just rubber rocks to many modelers in the country because they're made by a geologist in Connecticut who's not into this, but he doesn't, does not advertise much, but these are very accurate. If you're, if you're modeling in the, the West Coast, he has rocks for that. He has rocks for the East Coast. But he has a lot of beautiful shapes. And it allows me to do different things around curves. So the rocks are very important, being the rubber rocks. The other one 
is I've got thousands of trees. And these trees are, it's a kit like from Scenic Express. This is his super trees. And, and this is, has become recognized as the most realistic tree in modeling in the country. Many, many people have changed over what they started with. Fortunately, in Ohio, I started with these from the beginning and have built them. It's just a several step process. It takes a little time, but it gives you a gives you the most realistic tree. One of the other things that has been a big part of the railroad, uh, besides that scenic part, is on all of my buildings, and we'll see more of them shortly, is the, sign, the signage. I, I originally built buildings, which were, were nice buildings, but my signage was terrible. And I have a good friend in Boston named Mike Tylek, who's a big time modeler, who makes these signs, and so I, I get him to custom make them for each building all along, and it has added a great deal of conversation from people when they're visiting here. But that's the main thing. This is a good place to show this. So The, the next area to look at is the major city co yard that is north of Chattanooga. So it's the main southern, one of the main southern railway yards for freight car distribution, and even in the 1940s, it was a large yard. This is to represent that yard with some industry surrounding it. And here's a lumber supplier, a chemical company, a tannery, a coal for local distribution, that type thing, with some company houses. And then you move on down into the, towards the yard. When the, tra when the mainline trains come in, Diesels, if there are diesels, they separate and come over to a diesel shop over here. If there's steam engines, they go by that all the way to the far end that we'll see shortly. And the cars are picked up here by switch engines and pulled down for separation. Then the longer tracks we'll see have the outbound train set up for leaving. So it's, just, it's a long, large model yard with uh, freight car and uh, make up for trains and, and then the, all freight. This is the busy end of the yard. It has uh, on, the, on the background of it are a number of buildings, which is this is the back side of the buildings, which uh, are, are manufacturers, they're uh, warehouses for distribution. They're sitting but on this end of the yard is where everything starts. You've got the uh, ash pits, the coaling tower, the water tower. But this is all for servicing steam locomotives. And on the Southern Railway in the 40s, they, were, they had some of the best maintained locomotives in the country. All of the Southern engines that served that pulled passenger trains were painted green with gold striping, such as the small one there and there. All the freight engines were all black. They had maroon cab tops. And these are very accurate locomotives uh, for the original Southern Railroads. This is a small roundhouse. Even some modelers build much larger ones. My approach has always been I wanted to have locomotives sitting outside that have been serviced in there, ready to go out on trains. And when visitors are here, we have the headlights on there, and they make their noises and sounds. And and uh, and you can see this. Too many people have great big roundhouses, and then you can't see any of the locomotives. But the and then what is often often passed by on these things is small buildings. I always made sure I had small support buildings for all of this. Little unloading docks small building where uh, some of the workers worked out of. Little small supply buildings. It's all part of the roundhouse area. And, uh, and this is an area that focuses so much attention with all the locomotives because that's one of the real features of, of the 1940s railroad. I think that's probably good here. This area here has been one of the most popular over the years for visitors and uh, myself. This represents a small yard uh, attached it's at the end of freight yards where they would bring in refrigerator cars for icing, 
they bring in cars that needed small repairs. And icing platforms were on every railroad. Back in the 1940s, when this is, and, and even later, refrigerator cars carried everything from fruit, meat, anything that needed to be cold to be delivered to the public from the farms. And they had to be about every 300 miles, there had to be icing platforms because the, the ice was loaded into hatches and the top salt uh, put on it, and then and then they would go. And, and there's a number of different types of icing platforms available, but this one is a copy of one in South Carolina, exactly the way it was built, photographed it, and it was still in use, even though a little more modernized than this. But a typical scene would be the ice house would provide the, making the ice this one is a double track one, and it comes out on both ends. And the, and the ice would come out of these big blocks, and there's little chains here to show how they pulled it. They pulled out on these to the different places, and as it passed different areas that needed more ice, I've got the right men with the right tools. They would pull the ice off, and in the 1940s, chainsaws were the way they would cut it up. Uh, I don't know how they kept from cutting the platforms, but they apparently did. But they would cut the ice into different chunks that would fit into the refrigerator cars. This is this has is, is really been a scene, uh, part of this whole yard. It has a story when it follows around where the workers come in. This part of the building, of the, of the scene, is a rip track, they call it, a uh, repair in place. Every small yard had something very similar to this, and some large yards did back in those days. And this is an accurate representation. It has all the little walkways for repair. It has all the little pallets loaded with everything from air brakes, comfort items, grab irons, anything that a car needed. It's in here. I also have the, where cars were bringing the supplies, unloading oil drums, unloading wheels. But the little scene on the back here is absolutely taken from photographs of the actual scenes in the 1960s, still being done like this where they had to replace wheels or replace side frames. And back then, all of your wheels were not roller bearing, they were friction bearing. So the friction bearings had to be replaced. And this little scene, as crude as it looks, was accurate to the way they did it with this little hoist and kept that, that ran all the time. You have a little wood shop attached because back then all the boxcars had wood lining. And so I've got a wood a truck unloading lumber here Here's a wood shop for having stuff ready for boxcar repair. But that's what this represents. And, the, uh, and then you have the typical after work. There's a little place where the workers shower and, and a bunch of cars and a bus bringing workers in. But this scene has, has attracted more attention. It has a great deal of detail. It's all accurate detail and has been in, featured in many stories. And it is truly the favorite, probably one of the real favorites of this railroad. We're now in the, in the state of Kentucky. The first town in Kentucky on the south end is Somerset on the Southern Railway. And this little scene here is to represent more of a residential area because people have said to me several times, you need more houses for people to live in instead of working in buildings. So these are houses uh, one of the most noticed things on this whole railroad is people from Cincinnati will notice these little garages under the houses just with the concrete fronts and the steps going up. But this this is just a little series of buildings on this creek, which is a, a very pretty creek. It's, a, it's falling as it moves around. And these are just little barbecues and fruit stands and filling stations and sandwich shops and a wall, paint and wallpaper store. The highlight middle one is the Sassy Shack. Sassy. Uh, this is for Lou Sassy, a photographer on, from Model Railroader. And uh, I've got a little saying about whatever happens at Sassy's stays at Sassy's. But it's uh, just a little night place uh, for eating and a little grocery store. But it's just a residential scene with some small businesses over the creek. And then it, it did lead across that covered bridge to more of a town area. The only industry that is somewhat in this scene 
is the name Southern Iron and Equipment Company, named after the company I worked for in Atlanta. The buildings do not look like this. But this is meant to be just a little rural car shop for repairs, light repairs on, on little freight cars. And uh, this one happens to be detailed on the inside, but it's a nice rural rough structure, obviously with leaking roofs. Here are two of the scenes that were side by side in the town of Somerset businesses. The first one, and both of them have a little comedy built into them. The first one is Malazzo, M-I-L-A-Z-Z-O, chemicals. This is to represent a uh, building that makes something liquid in, in uh, Kentucky. And the story behind it is uh, Richard Malazzo, who is my uh, sister's lifetime uh, partner. His, his family's from Sicily, and he's a, uh, he is definitely an Italian. And so this is to represent an idea that so there was a tank cars in the back of the, of the building with all the hoses hooked up. They pump liquids into the tanks. They come into the building. And then there's a little supply building there. Here's the office right here. And Richard Malazzo, the sky of the family, is visiting with his sports car and his butler. I mean, his chauffeur. But it, what this is to represent was uh, the idea that something is made in here and the family is from Sicily and they made wine and other things in Sicily and they moved to the U.S. during Prohibition. And in Kentucky, they set up this plant, which no one really knew what was made here. And, uh, and the workers that worked here over the years, the grandfathers told their sons and grandsons, the best thing to do is never ask what you're making because it means safety. And there's nothing really close to really yes, that one. This building here was one of my favorite buildings. Uh, this one is the Barber Family's Cabinet Company, which is a real group. There's five brothers in this family. John Barber, who was the head of the sales, was a lifetime friend of mine who is still selling cabinets. And I bought cabinets for this from this company down in Springfield, Kentucky. But this is represented to be in Somerset for uh, 40 years, from houses, apartments, schools, everything. But and in this little scene, one of the reasons I built it, which is a little hard to see, but on the roof is his wife Kay capturing pigeons and putting them in this cage. John sitting there drinking beer, watching her, and uh, she said, "Well." Pigeons are a delicacy in the South. And, uh, but it just had all the complete sawdust, all the little details, things happening, and uh, it's been a, a real favorite and a very popular building for people. The next area is just north of Somerset, Kentucky, <clears throat> called Stearns, S-T-E-A-R-N-S. Stearns is an old town that's been there for a couple hundred years with coal mines and lumber. That was their two big businesses. They had a number of coal tipples, and they had a number of uh, logging locations. This is to represent one of the old time tipples. It uh, has a, the uh, coal coming out in little cars, being pulled by ropes into, uh, into, a cru into the crusher building on top, and it would go down to a building which is a sorting building and then out into a building that had belts in it that would deliver the coal into coal cars. And the uh, miners' union building is on the side, and this is the company main office plus some uh, just receiving. And this type scene would have coal cars, empties, and loads out front being brought to this scene. This building happens to have complete interior, which is rarely seen because it's not sitting up on kind of a hill, but Based on the book that I got this from, it had I got represented the whole interior in that building. Next, next to that building, because this is in Stearns, Kentucky, also. Southern Railway, uh, also by the way, had a double track main line from Chattanooga all the way up to Cincinnati, and uh, that was one of the few railroads that had double track. This, uh, this. 
tower here, it was just like by accident because this was torn down back in about the 1950s and all the remains of it is some concrete footings. But a friend of mine sent me a postcard that she found in an, an antique show about the Southern, she saw Southern Railway and thought I'd be interested in Senate. It's the only known picture, it is in a few books, of this double track colon temple. It's the only one on the entire Southern Railway that served both main lines at the same time. So I took the picture, was able to get a one direct line, drew the building from the one side, built it out of basswood, and it is a very accurate built to the original, but it's an interesting one that will be on the future double track main line. This uh, next scenes, this is made up of two dioramas. The one up here on the hill, which again is coming north, is Danville, Kentucky. This is to represent uh, Danville, which is further on up the railroad from Stearns. And it started with my idea that I was always uh, fascinated by these passenger trains that would pass these small towns and they would drop off a Pullman car and then the next day when they came through, they would pick it up, load it, and leave another empty. Since this is a track that goes to Cincinnati and then on into Chicago, this is one of the trains that is a Florida to, Florida to Chicago back and forth. So I started with the little Pullman car, and the idea of this scene, again, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but the train is about 45 minutes away. So people are coming out. They've got a lot of parked cars. They're coming out after checking in, and it's September, so people going to Chicago have overcoats on, they're being, they're loaded, and they're being loaded into the Pullman car, and then people are walking across to get on the train on the other side. This is an all-Pullman train, so it's a sleeper. Then, like I normally do, I wind up having the elevations, which I like changes in elevations. This goes up to a main street in town, and and these, this is the back view of those buildings, which in, in these days, buildings are on Main Street. If there was any fall off, they got all their deliveries on the rear of the building, which would be loaded into their basements. That's what this is to represent. These are different buildings, you know, feed store, hardware, and, and, uh, and they receive everything at that level. And the Main Street's up here. And then at the end, I've got apartment buildings, and a car repair thing, and then just a whole stretch of buildings, which is a blend of kits and scratch belt, with the names of about 30 people from Cincinnati mostly, and businesses that kind of fit my idea there. At the end of the street are the saloon and bar, which is at 4 o'clock, and so there are people sitting around there and littering bottles on the street. This has all the telephone lines and power lines going to each building, and it's a very often photographed site. The one, the one in front is one that this is one of the most recent ones that I did. I built this this year. And uh, the front building is a scratch built building from photographs of an earlier model, which I always liked the building. And then I was, after talking to friends, we decided it would make a good dis distillery. Now, we named this one Statesman after the movie that came out about the English group. And, uh, and we made this uh, for two of the Cincinnati good friends, Rick Crumrine and Roy Hort. So this is the Crumrine and Hort Statesman Brewery making Kentucky bourbon whiskey. And then, and then, we have the office building here where they're entertaining some out-of-town people. And this is built out of, out of wood, uh, laser-cut brick. This is where the crew does their changing clothes and, and washing up. And we've got some tables out here where people are eating after work. And then we have the two smaller buildings in height where they're storing the whiskey in barrels. And this scene has trucks bringing it. The forklifts bringing the barrels around and uh, boxcars being unloaded. And a, a lot of just a lot. Of, this scene here represents a typical stopover on a main line in rural areas for overnight locomotive servicing. 
Now what you see here is steam and diesel engines pulled in for service. The crews can spend the night. We have a place here, Sandra's Railroad Boarding House. They've got meals and rooms. And then we've got the uh, engine house here for just repairs or servicing. Not much repairs. We have the coal cars pulled in, unloading coal here into this coal tipple. And, uh, and this, uh, this is where they put the coal and ash pits. It's all the normal servicing for overnight. And that's what it's to represent. It's just a quick stop right off of the main line. And then the, at the end is just a little small car repair building. But this uh, is pretty accurate to the representation of these stops that are away from main yards. These two scenes are prominent in that sense are two of my favorite scenes. They will be in a great place on the new railroad. They run, we keep, I keep one just like this in front of the other. This scene in the rear was built in the 19, early 1990s and it represents refrigerator car repair. For the company, private companies like refrigerator cars, if they had something that was needed, the railroads would not service them. They had to ship them back in bad order. So they made deals with people in small areas, but not necessarily but in any area, to repair their cars. This one represents a little rural refrigerator car repair. It's got all the details inside. I turned this one up so you can see see the, all the rafter structure in the buildings. The office and shower room has complete details. And again, that detail out back, and again, that detail out back of repairing the changing wheels or truck work. And then a place up here where they could repair lining with, there's people pulling wood up to do woodwork on the, on the sides of the car. That's a very accurate model. And the one in front of it is a very accurate picture of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, maybe even 50s rural pulpwood yards. Pulpwood is a big product uh, coming from the south. It's mostly pine trees, but it's it's used for uh, shipments going to paper companies to make paper. And this is representative of where farm trucks would bring in pulpwood on daily basis, and they would just they had a way of, of dumping their logs, they always came in with wires under there where they could lift them up and dump them in these stacks. And then they had these, these type of yard cranes like this that would, they'd wrap the, a lot of handwork, but they would wrap the logs up, pick them, load them on cars. A little facility like this could send out three or four cars a day. This whole scene in, in these areas is in Erlanger, Kentucky. We're getting very close to the Ohio River. These are a couple of small industries. You have a tank car repair, a Hammond tank car repair down there, which again is private tank car companies contracting small companies to repair their cars. This little scene here, which has probably been photographed more and has won more prizes than anything I've ever done, was built in the late 80s. This is called Wilmot Table Company, and it represents the complete interiors. It represents a company it was supposedly formed in 1920-something with all the machinery that's belt-driven, just like it would have been in the 40s for sawing and planing lumber. And then they've got a little assembly line inside showing all the tables being built. And then a staining room where they're staining the tables and putting finish, and then an elevator where it would go down at night to be shipped out. And this has really been, a, this has really been a, an eye-catcher. This won the actual Gazette Award at a National Narrow Gauge Convention in 2007. And uh, I've had people, visitors come here with pictures from the magazines wanting to see this building. But it fits in, these two fit in together and, this, and will be done very similar to this the next time around with the trust lot here. This just represents various businesses in a little, again, close to in Erlanger, different types of things, a cabinet maker, a welding shop, and so on. And uh, this is leading to the river area. This covered bridge crosses some tracks up to the northernmost part of the Erlanger, right on the edge of the Ohio River. Finally made it to the Ohio River through Kentucky. 
this scene on the Ohio River is about 10 to 15 miles east of downtown Cincinnati. What this is to represent is this side of the river is Kentucky still with some businesses over here and this side is Ohio and I'm called this is named North Bend, Ohio. This down here has two or three very interesting kinds of things. It has a business with a an old stern wheeler, which in the 40s there was a lot of stern wheelers running. This is a, a model of a real riverboat. It's a difficult model to build. And it has the passenger deck and a freight area and it's people coming down through a railroad car and loading and lots, lots of detail here of people getting on and freight getting on, small freight. The metal building here is, is uh, just a boat, a small boat repair, boat sales, boat rentals, motor repairs, Randy Kirkus. And the last one is what is a uh, ship's chandler, which many people have not heard of. And that's the company that supplies, supplies the passing boats that are too big to pull over near a shore. So it could be everything from food to motor repair parts to whatever they order. And as a, as a boat is passing, they run out with a small boat to provide it for them. What the river shows in the far end over there under the bridge is a stern wheeler. It is an accurate model of a stern wheeler and, and frankly a very accurate uh, representation of the water coming off of the wheels done right off of photographs. The uh, pushing bar coal barges, we've got some uh, little shanty boats sitting beside the, the on the edge far side on the Ohio. This is a little boat that takes passengers up and down the river to different towns. That's, a, that's an actual model of a, a boat for that in Mystic, Connecticut. This is just a freighter. All of these were built from kits. The, uh, and on the far end over here, we have the uh, same thing, a, a stern wheeler pushing the barges. On the other side of the hill over here uh, is this North Bend, Ohio, grocer's sash and door over there behind the bridge. It has a, a large building here, which is Chuck Indriola's tomato sauce company. And that's, that's, that is a very good detail. All the way on the, past the bridges on the river, there's a Riverview Hotel being renovated with a casino being built. So it just represents uh, life, and then we have a small town area there with businesses in the middle. And this is just on the Ohio side of the river. The last scene on the Ohio River currently is a coal loading facility which is called the Swain and LaRue, Ed Swain and Kurt LaRue, two wonderful friends and modelers. This is their river coal transportation. The idea here is coal cars are brought in full from the mines on the, on the other end of the railroad, pushed through here and coal loaded into barges, and then the empties are pulled out daily by train going back south. So this is just barges being loaded, another barge barge being put, barge being brought by a little tug to here, and then a bridge here to help break the river. This little scene is a, is a diorama that I built this past January, February, March, and it represents a furniture company. It's the individual different buildings. This is pieces of kit, pieces of scratch building. And I liked, the, I had pictures of this type of a building and uh, made this one a furniture company. And it has a, this is the, where they unload lumber. And from the cars, they bring it around to this main shop here. They've got an engineering office up on top. They bring the lumber in, a scrap lumber stacked around. It goes, when they machine it all, it goes into this three-story building where they make tables and chairs, assemble them, and then they bring them through the middle and wind up finishing them in this little building here with the heat lamps to take care of the finish. And then it has a showroom on the back side. But this one is, uh, was made for my friend Chuck Andreola. And uh, I say a man of many hidden talents and hidden enterprises. He spent many years managing a gourmet restaurant. 
be frequented by the Lake Erie Mafia, partially due to the exact recreation of Frank Sinatra's voice that Chuck has. He then moved into the tomato sauce production with a large plant on the Ohio River, a model which we've seen in the last scene. Recently, he's taken over a, a long-established, honest furniture company, making gaming tables for casinos, thus solidifying his long, profitable connection to the Lake Area Mafia. Mr. Tracy can be seen checking out the premises in the front of the area, which he's over there. But that's what this represents.